Okay, we are interviewing uh, Judge Eisenberg, who is running for re-election as municipal court judge. Um, judge Eisenberg, can you give us a uh, opening statement? A, uh, sure. Happy to. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. Uh, so my name is Adam Eisenberg. I am running to retain my seat on the Seattle Municipal Court bench, position number three. I was first appointed back in 2017, and then I ran for an election to retain my seat in 2018, and I'm doing so again in 2022. I had the benefit of an endorsement from you the last time, and so I'm hoping I can get one again. Um, my background is I was a prosecutor. Uh, well, actually, I was a journalist before I was a prosecutor. And um, uh, so I covered television and movies uh, as a freelance journalist. And then I came to law school and uh, ended up working as a prosecutor. Then I was interested in getting some civil experience because I had a sense that I wanted to be on the bench. And so I worked for, uh, did some personal injury cases for about five years on the civil side. And then I was first appointed as commissioner to municipal court by the judges back in 2004. That through the budget issues that happened at the end of 2010, that became a magistrate position. And then in 2017, I, I sought appointment and was appointed to the elected position. Um, as we talk tonight, I'm gonna to discuss really probably two programs that I'm very actively involved in. My current role is as a full-time domestic violence related uh, caseload. And in that capacity, I'm involved in a, a really a revolutionary program that we're doing in Seattle Support, a restorative justice program that's an alternative to jail called the DVIP program, Domestic Violence Intervention Project. It's an individualized treatment model that's designed to uh, address people's individual issues related to domestic violence. That could include chemical dependency, it could include mental health. And it's a community-wide effort with many different partners including the Salvation Army, Coalition Ending Gender-Based Violence, the YWCA, the Mayor's Office on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault, the City of Seattle City Attorney's Office, Harborview Medical Center, treatment providers uh, like ACRS, which has been involved in our program until just this year, um, act and and Wellspring previously, and we're working with researchers from the University of Nebraska. So I'll 10 be- 10 seconds. I'm sorry, 10 seconds? Yeah, sorry. I think that probably in some of our, our um, questions as we move forward. So I'll stop right there. Appreciate it. I, I hate to cut you off too, just trying to keep it on track. Um, so uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, our first prepared question, um, Clayton, do you want to take the first one? Sure. <clears throat> um, what are the elements of your background and experience that make you best qualified to earn our endorsement? Um, thank you. Uh, so when I was a prosecutor, I worked a lot in domestic violence cases. And then I also, because of my media background, became uh, participated in the Domestic Violence Council, which was a city, actually countywide council. Um, and we did public forums. I actually produced public forums uh, in my role as an attorney, but really more as a, a, a person involved in the domestic violence committee to uh, public forums that city council members sponsored. And we discussed many different aspects of domestic violence. So. I, and I've written for the Seattle PI several pieces about domestic violence related issues. And um, so when I became appointed and I'm now in charge of a full domestic violence caseload, I, I think I'm uniquely qualified. Seattle Municipal Court deals with uh, domestic violence, DUIs, many other crimes. A lot of the domestic violence cases that are prosecuted, actually some of them are felony drop downs, meaning the felony court decides that the assault isn't quite serious enough. So it lands at Seattle Municipal Court. And one of the things that's happened in the last couple of years is because of our DVIP program, the Domestic Violence Intervention Project, um, we've been able to offer alternatives to the traditional domestic violence prosecution. My background as a prosecutor, as well as a person who's written about domestic violence issues, um, including an op-ed piece that I did in October, urging the state legislature to help pay the cost of domestic violence treatment for perpetrators, individuals who have to go through the program. Um, I think makes me uniquely qualified because Seattle Support is one of the places where really there's like um, 1,800 cases that are filed every year that are domestic violence related, which we know is just the tip of the iceberg. So I think my background in domestic violence and my position in Seattle Municipal Court as the DV judge, as the domestic violence judge, is one of the reasons that I would say I'm uniquely qualified for this position. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, question, prepared question number two. Um, Laura, do you want to take that one? In what ways can the courts better serve those of moderate or low financial means in civil actions? Okay, so first you should know that Seattle Support doesn't do 
uh, traditional civil actions, most of those are taken care of, like small claims court is done in district court. The kind of civil cases that we hear are traffic tickets. We also hear zoning issues, dog bite cases, things like that. Um, one of the ways that we address um, traffic tickets, first of all, the Seattle Supreme Court, uh, the judges have, we've basically agreed to suspend most of the, uh, virtually all non-mandatory fines and fees. Um, but we have a youth traffic court, which is the second program I was gonna highlight where Garfield High School students serve as judges, juries, prosecutors, defense attorneys for other teenagers who've gotten traffic tickets in the city of Seattle. Uh, it's a collaborative program between us, Seattle University Law School, which provides mentor students to mentor the high school students, Garfield High School and Seattle Police. Uh, um, Off-duty police officers volunteer their time to appear to help educate the students. So this is a great opportunity for students who get a ticket and they can be very expensive, 150 or if it's an insurance ticket, it'd be $500. Um, if they agree to do the program, they can pay at most $25. And if they can't afford that, we waive it. And the ticket will not show up on their driving record, which means it doesn't affect insurance. And they get the chance to get a taste of the court system, to see an, uh, um, a, a taste of restorative justice because high school students will tell them, you need to write a two page paper, you need to interview an officer, you need to go driving on a one way street in the right way with your parents, so you can learn how to drive better. Um, it's a great opportunity and it's one way that actually we do help students, young kids in particular, avoid expensive traffic tickets, uh, which of course can affect kids of all income backgrounds. So that's one way we're doing it. Great, thank you. Uh, Consuelo, do you wanna take number three? Yes, thank you. Describe your approach to management of the criminal and civil section of the prosecutor's office, including attracting and retaining qualified and qualified and diverse staff. What do you sorry, believe? Sorry, Consuela, the, the latest number three is in the chat. That's what I'm reading. Um, yes. yeah, prosecutor probably, someone running for the prosecutor's office, I suspect. Oh, here it is. Sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry, sorry, my bad. <laughs> no, I had the chat button really little. <laughs> okay, if presiding over the criminal docket, where, where, what role do you think judges should take? And what would you take, if any, in diverting defendants to diversion programs such as the drug court, mental health court, and other diversion programs or other alternatives to incarceration? Okay, so the Domestic Violence Intervention Project is a diversion program most of the time. The city attorney's office has agreed uh, for many of the people that instead of getting a conviction, they'll make it a pre-trial diversion program. So that's one way that we do that. Um, the goal is to get them through the treatment program and hopefully give them the tools they need so they don't come back to the court system. Uh, and it is, as I said, an alternative to jail if they participate in the program. So that's one example. We do have a mental health court. We do not do drug court in Seattle Municipal Court. That's uh, done on the county level. But we do have a mental health court. We have a veterans treatment court. Um, we also have a community court. All of those are, are in, depending on the individual situation, mental health court is more complicated because sometimes those are, it's not just a diversion court. Uh, and veterans court also is not necessarily a diversion court. It's meant to assist veterans. Sometimes they have repeat DUIs, but putting them in veterans court where their treatment can be coordinated with the, the criminal side and help kind of get them through it um, is certainly a, a valuable form of restorative justice and an alternative to jail. Um, but the community court is definitely one of our programs that is meant to divert people out of the court system very early on once you hook them up with services and hopefully they can move on. So we have many different programs that are diversion programs, and I'm totally support. Our, our judges are very much in favor of therapeutic diversion type courts. All right, thank you. Uh, question number four, Barbara, do you want to take that one? I'll try. Um, what is your position on bail reform? What factor do you or would you consider when designing when deciding whether or not to impose bail? And what changes would you advocate for if elected? So as a judge, I can't really, uh, I, I have to abide by the court rule 3.2, which gives very specific guidelines on when bail should be imposed. First is, what's the, is there a substantial likelihood they're going to fail to show up to court? And I can tell you that through one of the COVID experiences of my colleagues and I, I think, is that the failure to appear for court is not really an overriding factor on setting bail as much as it might have been in years past. 
Uh, so in other words, we give people more opportunities to go to show up, whether it's virtually or, or by phone sometimes. Um, but the factors that, that you do have to take really seriously is a substantial likelihood they're going to commit a violent crime. So if it's a second DUI or a third DUI or it's a, sec or it's a domestic violence related assault, then you're looking at the facts and trying to decide in this particular case, <laughs> substantial likelihood they're going to injure the party or injure someone. If so, then bail is appropriate under the rule. And then the third is interfering with the administration of justice or witnesses. So again, in domestic violence cases, that could be, do we, when you read the police report, when you look at the background, the history, do you think it's likely they're gonna interfere with the victim by violating the no contact order or which would be also an interference with the administration of justice. In DUI cases, if it's a second or third DUI, are they likely to abide by your rule to uh, abstain from alcohol and marijuana and other drugs? So. It's really a case by case basis when you decide bail. And I can tell you that at each case you look at individually, there's not like a, an ironclad rule for it. So um, the conversation of whether we should have bail or not, those are conversations that are argued in other states, including California and here as well. At the end of the day, as a judge, I'm looking out for the community safety as well as the victim individual safety in terms of trying to determine whether bail should be set. So it really is uh, each case on its own basis is the best that you know we can do thank you okay well thank you for that um we're going to open it up to questions from the e-board and reminder you have one minute to answer these questions okay anybody want to go first sure um judge eisenberg um what's the what do you think is has been the most formative single experience that you've had uh, that shaped your decisions to become a judge? Uh, I guess I would have to say, you know, it's my experience before I was in an elected position. There, there's, you know, a lot of experiences. Um, I think one issue, one case that comes to mind is a gentleman by last name is, is Carter, Mr. Carter, and he was in mental health court. And I was not a regular judge at that time. I was a commissioner, but I ended up handling his case over two years. And Mr. Carter, when he was on his medications on a regular basis, he had to get an intermuscular shot twice a month, as well as other medications. When he stayed on his medications because he was required to through mental health court, he did pretty well. And then he graduated after two years because that was the limit of our of jurisdiction. And within six months, he, he compensated. He went off his medication. He ended up assaulting his girlfriend that he'd been in a relationship for two years successfully without any you know, arrest. Then after that, a month or two later, he ended up knifing someone on, on, on a bus. And ended 10 up, seconds. Oh, sorry. So that kind of experience made me realize the value of therapeutic courts, uh, but also, and, and also the value of doing programs like DVIP. And so I guess I would say that's shaped because I really believe in those things. That's one of the reasons that I want to stay and work on them. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, Barbara, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. So I would like to ask Judge Eisberg, you mentioned and said some uh, really interesting things uh, in your um, comments so far about the two programs that you care about very much. Would you like to expand on this? Is there anything else that you'd like us to know about them and hear about them? Sure, so let me tell you about the, the DVIP program. So the way it works is someone gets a very detailed assessment and that assessment determines that they have chemical dependency issues, mental health issues, as well as domestic violence issues. If so, um, and regardless of what the answer is, a multidisciplinary team is put together that includes treatment providers, uh, victims advocates, uh, the, the a probation counselor, and this group meets regularly to try to massage the treatment and try to make it as effective for this individual as possible. We also have regular court hearings and we're doing a research study. We've gotten some federal grants from the Violence Against Women Act office to help support research to see if this program, which is based on best practices out of Colorado and Maryland, can actually really make a difference. And early indications are it does, but we are very intent on making it research you know, valuable so that other jurisdictions in our state can potentially develop a similar program. So that's a program I'm particularly proud of. And um, it's, it's such a collaborative effort with so many different community partners. It, it's really a wonderful, wonderful program. Great, thank you. We've got time for maybe one more question. Uh, 
I don't have a question, but I do have a comment, if I may. Um, go, yeah, go no, ahead. I'll let, I'll let somebody else go. Yeah, Laura, go Laura, you have your hand up. Sure, I, I would like to ask about um, using uh, virtual formats or you know, a hypothetical um, hybrid virtual formats for court hearings and whether or not you uh, thought that had a, a positive or a negative um, impact on um, access to the criminal justice system during COVID. Thank you. So that's been a very interesting challenge. Uh, yes, it does help uh, access for folks it creates problems, however, for example, if interpreters are involved, it gets really complicated because people can't really see each other the same way. Um, also, sometimes you have to tell people, um, sir, you should put a shirt on. Uh, this is a court, we, are, you know, we need to dress properly. Sometimes it's the attorneys that you have to say, uh, really, is that how you're showing up to court? Um, for some folks, the technology is a boon. It allows them to not have to come to court. Other folks really struggle with the technology. And so it's, it's complicated. I think ultimately the hybrid system will continue. Uh, you do have to appear in person for trials, for example. Um, but I think that for a lot of hearings, it'll continue to uh, evolve and be part of the system there are pluses and minuses, just like we all know as doing Zoom that there's pluses and minuses. We experience that in court too. Paperwork can be really challenging. People don't have the same interaction. They can't see each other the same way, so they don't notice the interpreter needs a moment to interpret. Uh, you need to take a break, you know, things like Ten that. Seconds. So, um, so I think it's here to stay. Uh, some days are good, some days are bad. Technology is not always our friend, but it is our reality. So that's how I would answer your question. Thank you. Well put. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have time for a one minute closing statement. Uh, if you wanna give that to us and thank you again. Sure, I just, I, I just wanna thank you for the opportunity to come speak to you. Uh, I am really, really excited about the domestic violence program that we're doing. Uh, it's unique in the state. And so, and you know, I think it's a, it's a, really a nice, I think the city council can take credit for it. The mayor's office can take credit because everyone's sort of involved in it in some way. So I'm really proud of that. Uh, and as I mentioned in the op-ed piece that I wrote in October, I was really, really encouraging the state legislature to help pay individual costs because unlike chemical dependency or mental health, which are covered by insurance, domestic violence treatment is not. So that and the youth court are the two programs that I'm most interested in, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm just a judge handling cases. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to continue to do that. And I thank you very much for all of your hard work because I know it's not easy doing what you guys are doing to keep democracy, you know, in action, so thank you. Appreciate it, Judge Eisenberg. Thank you very much. I'm gonna stop the recording and